Hey y'all, welcome to the Clock Tower. I'm Colton, here with Brandon. Rumble is over. Three tournaments, a lot of players, over 300 decks, over 30 different sets were represented. By and large, pretty successful. We've been burning the Midnight Oil, mostly Brandon, on this data set, and we finally have more or less a complete account of everything that went down. So let's get into it. First things first, top eight. And we will start in AO, which was the first tournament of the weekend. Four data live decks in top eight, led by Vince, who won it all, defeated Kisa in the final. Cirque was on Fate Stay Night and defeated Hakase on Kaguya. And then Pekaha on Dal, Nicholas Banville on Kaguya, Sangar Perwantoro with Adventure Time, and Varga playing Data Live rounded out the top eight. 78 total players in AO, including some of the best in the world, some of whom are you know, obviously on this list. But before we get too far into dissecting results, I do think that we need to talk about how this tournament was run. Brandon, there were some issues top to bottom with AO, and it made for a frustrating experience. Rounds were exceedingly long, but like the space in between the rounds allowed there just to be a lot of just downtime. Even if you were going to time and into overtime, and even at the end of overtime, you still had a significant amount of time in between your matchups. And this was something that was always going to plague any online tournament. And I can understand some delay issues and some timing issues, right? You're trying to run an online tournament with dozens of people from, you know, literally all over the world, bunch of different time zones. But there were significant delays between rounds for AO every round. Rounds took almost an hour and a half. And then not only were the rounds taking a long time, there was a lot of confusion about how many rounds there were going to be because the book, the rule text, the document that they had published saying we are going to follow these rules said that based on the number of players who are participating, there would be six rounds. And then a couple of rounds into the tournament, they announced there were going to be eight rounds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a couple hours into this tournament, you're telling your player base, oh, by the way, you're here for an extra three hours. If they had been up front with that from the beginning, that would have been of a concern. During the um, orientation, they announced at that point it was going to be six rounds. And then it was about after the first or second round that they announced it was going to be eight rounds. And there were plenty of frustrated people in the uh, in the Discord. Uh, understandably so, with like 78 people going eight rounds is excessive. They ultimately cut it to seven, which again, wasn't the number that was in the rules document or what they had said beforehand. So that was frustrating. Like as a player, you want to come in knowing what you're getting into, knowing, you know, how much commitment you're about to make, how much time you're about to invest in this, you know, what to prepare for, especially if you're in an off time zone. And the fact that this number literally changed three times over the course of, you know, the first couple hours of the tournament is a frustration. So don't want to harp on that too much, and we'll talk about how EU kind of demonstrated that these issues aren't endemic to these kinds of tournaments. This tournament didn't have to be like this, but it was, and it was a frustration. Don't want to harp on that too much, so let's get back into talking about the actual event. First thing, obviously, we noticed Data Live's the winner. Data Live coming off of a really strong Spring Fest. Immediately comes in, gets four top eights, both top twos and the title. I don't know what to tell y'all. Vince is the best player in the world, and when you give him the best deck in the world, it's going to be hard to beat him. And there are some really good people in this field. This is a really strong field. Obviously, you know, a lot of the really good players from Australia and Asia, this being kind of their home time zone tournament, they showed up and they played. And, you know, it was a very strong, very dense field. I think this was probably the densest field in terms of talent. There was a lot of talented people in this tournament, and it was going to be a very stiff competition going in. Going in, I anticipated this would probably be the hardest tournament to top, only because in order to top, you would have to beat a good opponent almost every round. You weren't going to get any rounds against, you know, new players in trial decks like you might in some of the other regions, NA in particular. In AO, you were going to play someone good almost from the beginning. Every round, probably, you were going to have to play into someone who knew what they were doing. And it shows, 
right? Like, AO was easily the hardest region to hang around in, I think. A lot of really good players, you know, didn't make it super far, just because of how many other good players you were bound to run into. So aside from Dao, there are a couple other obviously interesting things here. One is Kaguya got a pair of tops in its first tournament in the meta, which is not really surprising to anybody. But I think the biggest surprise is not necessarily the presence of a single Fate deck in top eight. We talked about how Fate, you know, had a chance to top whatever. It's what topped because it was Gilshot. I don't think anybody expected Gilshot to be a regional level, you know, topping deck. But here we are talking about this goofy, you know, kind of meme deck from, you know, an older Fate set coming in and performing obviously really well. And out of all the people, we should be least surprised by this just because of how far Gilshot went when we were doing the Holy Grail War back over the summer. What was really interesting about this deck, Zero was really just kind of that survival turn, right? You had the Lancer that just helps you just try to keep cards on field. So that way when you get to that level 2 game, you just start burning for damage like crazy. The Gil combo with being able to... When you mill Soul Triggers, that you burn 1 based on the Soul Triggers revealed. With the Stock Soul Excalibur, and then its own Climax Gate of Babylon, 8 Stock Soul, your potential for burning massive numbers right away is really impressive and especially with a really lowered uh early game account like no level ones in this deck really kind of sets up this potential for pretty massive burns consistently it's dangerous for the same reason that love life sunshine is dangerous a lot of burns starting at level two like sure you'll get your reverses but can you stop from getting burned over and over and over again you know, basically every turn, once your opponent hits level two, they're going to be doing something, right? Because mm -hmm. it ran the saber top end. So it had cancel burns. It had two soul triggers. So it was going to be swinging for big numbers over and over and over again. You can't stop all of it. And, you know, this deck rode that strategy to a third place finish. You know, it was really well constructed and, you know, a good meta choice given what it was going to be playing into. And then finally, also in top eight, we had one Adventure Time, something that you and I were not very high on coming in. But here it is, Adventure Time's only top. It sneaks into AO. It still has that high damage top end, right? Because we're looking at the standby choice build. So you have that standby level one combo help build up stock for that end game. So you, know, you can get multiple instances of the Finn and Jake combo off. It also runs the uh, Demon Blood Sword to be able to kind of play into standby a little bit better. So it has a lot of those tools that you would expect to see from that choice top end combined with the standby client max one. Makes a lot of sense, especially what it was going into. While we didn't rate this deck very highly, the damage potential at the top, kind of alongside that fate deck, really kind of demonstrates how it made its way in. Moving on to EU. Another four out of eight performance from Data Live in this region, but the winner this time was Bofuri. We talked about Bofuri kind of at length when we did the preview video a couple of weeks ago, but I don't think we talked about this list. We talked about, you know, the chance for the two soul list to have a chance. Um, we didn't expect the standby list really to make too much noise. This was Pants Stock Soul, Brandon. This list was really designed to take on standby. It was expecting to play into a standby heavy meta. If we're looking at the big three being Dal, Kaguya, Slime, all standby decks keying into the 2-1 combo on the Stock Soul that allows you to return your opponent's characters back into their deck so they can't encore it back to field, they can't stop it from happening. Being able to clear a standby board with no way of your opponent being able to immediately keep those pieces on field and essentially draining them of their resources from hand. There's only so much a standby player can do against that. This stat's about to bust your head open. Tim played Bofuri into Dow seven times in this tournament. Four times in Swiss, and then every round of top eight won every game. If you're looking for the anti dow we have found it. 7-0 and against Data Live. Just an incredible performance, and a well-deserved win for Tim, for sure. Beating Vince who won AO just, you know, a few hours before. So also, Vince 
back-to-back finalists with a championship playing Data Live. Two other Dals rounding out top four. Kunan Kaguya, friend of the channel Darcy on Data Live, Kevin on Ruby, and Bao playing Sword Art. Ruby getting a top in its first tournament, pretty significant, and Sword Art getting its first top as well. Kaguya, its third top in two regions. Moving on to NALA, North America, Latin America. A very standby heavy top eight. Five eight standby lists with one uh, standby choice DAL. Joey Chen brings it home with Slime eight standby. A set that didn't get any tops in the first two tournaments. It got two in this one. The other one being Asana, who lost in the quarterfinal. YB taking Pants Book Sorter all the way to the final. Yuri on eight standby. Ruby finishing third. Tangiro on eight standby. Dal finishing fourth. Kronos. Love Live Sunshine. You and I talked about it. You and I talked about how Love Life Sunshine is well positioned simply because it does all this burn damage and it's really consistent. Here you go. Kronos, one of only two Love Life Sunshine players in the whole tournament, takes this one all the way to top eight with that Stock Soul Salvage build. Alan Liu on eight standby. I got to play him. Did a really good job putting together a list for a archetype that honestly I didn't see a whole lot of potential in long term. But he did a really good job, put together a really nice list, makes top eight. And there was one other Dal in top eight, Samuel on three choice, five standby, the only non eight standby Dal to top, bringing Data Life's total tops to 10 for the weekend. Brandon, thoughts on this region? A little more of a diverse region than the first two. Yeah. Really, really interesting to see. Slime f- making its way in during North America to be able to get into the top here. Almost like sneaking it in right at the end. Slime taking it all kind of like also says something about itself too. But the other thing that was really interesting about this regional, I think actually was YB's list itself. Kind of taking a different approach to a familiar build. R- very reminiscent of the Yuki Sinan last shot build. Same last shot top end, same generic tech throughout the deck that you would expect of that build. Interesting was changing it up from the Zekin to the Xenon combo. Actually makes a little bit more sense here because it sits a little bit more powerful defensively. That you can also then kind of play along with the, um, kind of that idea that that eight standby list has of trying just to continually pump power through counters to be able to keep your board at a, a very high power threshold too. The pants at one helps to kind of cycle the combo a little bit, just kind of like what you would try to do with bar. So it's very much a play on that build, but for the higher power threshold, which I think is a really unique idea for that. I think one of the cool things about this tournament is how there were unique builds that we didn't expect to see that did well. Like, sets that we know but with some pieces that maybe we didn't expect. Some people thinking outside the box, thinking, okay, there's a standby heavy meta. How am I going to deal with that? And that's where you come up with this Bofuri list that wins this, you know, eight standby sword art that does really well, YB sword art list. People coming up with things, coming up with ways to get into top eight, knowing what they're going to have to play into, knowing the situation that they're in, and being able to find a way to adapt and get around it. Obviously, Gil shot in AO, right? Creative deck building, being rewarded. Players playing something a little bit unorthodox, being rewarded. I think that's good for the health of the game because it encourages people to be more experimental and to stray more off the beaten path with their builds. Overall, obviously, everyone who got top eight did a really great job. Tip of the hat to all of them. They played really well. It's tough to make top eight at a major. And these guys all did it. All excellent players did a great job with their deck building and their playing over the course of the weekend. But now, let's talk about the rest of the tournament. 328 players. And there's a lot of data to pour over. There's a reason this show's coming out on Wednesday, not Tuesday. And this is what we've got. We're going to post a spreadsheet with this data and more broken down by each set in the description. You can check that out. On screen, we have all of the decks that got a top eight 
or we're in the top 10 of representation. So if you look down from the top, the top 10 are the top 10 in terms of representation, just the number of decks that were there. And the bottom two are the ones that also had a top, even though they weren't um, in the top 10 for representation. Both were ranked 11th and Love Life Sunshine tied for like 20 something. So left to right, what the numbers mean. Total, total number of decks. That's if a deck was played and it was data live in any of the regions, it goes here. This also counts again, everyone who played like the same deck twice. So for example, Vince played Dal in two different regions. He is two of these 68 for data live. Rep percentage, representation percentage, it's what percentage of the whole meta, what percentage of all of the decks played were of that set. Dow leading the way at 20.7%, Slime had 12.8%, etc. Win percentage is what it says on the tin, percentage of games won by that deck. Um, obviously, the further up you go, the more likely you are to be over 50%. X in 2 is the number of players who finished X in 2 or better. This includes players that topped. So Dal had 13 players who went X and 2, Slime had 7, Ruby had 8. Under top 8 is the number of players who made top 8. Again, we're double counting Vince because he made it to 2, but he's you know playing functionally as a different player in a different region. So 10 different instances of Dal making a top 8 over the weekend. The double asterisk there means that that deck won a tournament. So Dal, Slime, and Bovary. And then the final column is conversion percentage. This is the percentage of that total that went top eight. The average conversion percentage is 7.3%. So in a field of 328 players with 24 of them making top eight, that means 7.3% of players will make top eight. So that's kind of like the benchmark for what you would kind of expect a deck to make. So anything above that is kind of, you know, above average performance. Anything below that is below average performance in terms of, you know, the rate of making top eight for a set. Let's look at this chart. Let's look at these numbers. The bottom row is everything that isn't on this list, none of which got a top eight, none of which went X and two. If we're going to start at the top. Data Live. A lot of people coming in thought that Data Live was not going to be as dominant this time because there were a lot of other things that could compete with it. In terms of winning tournaments, that was correct. And that makes sense, right? We talked about how there were three sets that we expected to win a tournament or like it wouldn't be a surprise if they won a tournament. It would have been a surprise if Dal had not won, especially considering how many times it topped. But it is not a, it's not necessarily a surprise that Dal didn't, you know, sweep like it did at Springfest. It wasn't as dominant in top eight, but it was just as dominant in Swiss. Had a smaller representation rate, but got even more top eights than it did at Springfest. It got nine top eights at Springfest, got ten at Rumble, won fifty-four percent of its games, which was good for the third highest percentage out of everything in the top ten. Mm-hmm. Dal's dominant, and part of that dominance is because it's everywhere. I heard someone joking over the weekend that, you know, every time they killed one Dal, two more popped up in the next round, right? Like, Dal's just everywhere. It's hard to, you know, you can't just say that Dal is the best deck because it had the most tops or whatever, right? It's partially dominant just because it's everywhere. It is meta-warping. The meta is warped by the presence of this very powerful, almost exclusively eight standby lists. Like over 90% of the Dow lists were eight standby. All but one of its tops were eight standby. It's the most powerful archetype for sure. And based on these numbers, for all intents and purposes, still the most powerful deck in the meta, if only because it deals so well with almost everything. If you look at the overview data, which again, link in the description, and you look at Dal's matchups with everything, it had a winning matchup against all but two decks. You know, that's how dominance works. You can beat almost anything. You do beat almost anything. I am personally surprised. I thought that Slime was going to be its biggest challenge, just based on our playtesting and, you know, how that matchup looked on paper. 
but Dow won that matchup 59% of the time. Where Dow struggled, a lot of people were on this, but Kaguya won 64% of its games against Datalife. So Kaguya kind of positions itself as this anti-Dow, and it's the only thing that has like a considerable advantage over Data Live in the meta. Bofuri goes nine and eight against Data Live, and seven of those wins were one guy. <laughs> so like Data Live really just it bullied everything that wasn't Kaguya. And that's why it got so many X2s. That's why it got so many tops. Like there's a reason its conversion rate was higher. That's why the conversion rate is up here, so that you don't just go oh, it got more tops because there was more of it. No, its conversion rate was actually higher than everybody's too, including Kaguya, by a significant margin. You know, there's a reason that Data Live is, you know, doing so well, and it's because it's really gosh darn good, y'all. It's really good. Will Data Live be good in the future? I don't know what happens next, but for this moment right now, this meta that just took place this weekend, Data Live was the best deck, again. I don't know if it was so dominant that it needs a ban list or a restricted list or anything like that. Clearly, other things play into it better now than they did at Springfest. But Kurumi is still the queen of this meta. So kind of looking at that and recognizing that specific statistic, which I think is one of the more prevalent statistics here to talk about with that because of how many matchups there were with that, right? So we saw 33 games between Kaguya and Dao take place over the weekend with Kaguya coming in with a, all, about two-thirds majority of the time taking that win that really positions Kaguya in a really unique spot to be able to play off against that as well for Kaguya seeing really, one of the things that was really big to see against Kaguya was how well Ruby played into Kaguya yeah which is interesting because so two things one here at the clock tower we try to make our analysis based on data, right? It's easy to get tilted. It's easy to get frustrated. You know, it's easy to, you know, make assumptions, grab onto a narrative, and just hold on to that no matter what. It's super easy to do that. So for us, this data is less about trying to, like, reinforce what we thought going in and more about trying to get a better picture of what the meta actually is versus what we think it is, right? We're trying to learn from this data and try to extrapolate something from it so that we can understand where the meta is going and what's good and what's not. The second thing is, ultimately, as much as this is the most important tournament of the winter season for sure, it's still a relatively small sample size. So over the course of this tournament, there were over 830 games played, but like that's it. You mean only, only. Well, sure, but like in the context of like broad, you know, statistical analyses, only 33 games between Kaguya and Dao, and that was one of the heavier matchups. Like the most we saw of a matchup was Slime into Dao. They played each other 54 times. Can you really say that Konosuba has a favorable matchup going into Fate when they only played each other five times? And Konosuba won three of them? You know what I mean? Like, so there's definitely some small sample size going on here. Like, Ruby beat Kaguya 12 out of the 14 games they played each other. That feels a little much, right? I think that's a number that regresses to the mean. I say all of this to say that these are small sample sizes, unfortunately. Like, in the broad scheme of things, in a, you know, statistical, analytical way, these are still pretty small sample sizes. So there may be some outliers here that affect some things. Like Bofri being a perfect example. Does Bofri really have a plus matchup over Data Live? Or did one guy on one deck do really well against Data Live with Bofri and really skew those numbers hard? You know what I mean? That's the situation that we're in with these numbers. So take all of them with a grain of salt. The challenge now is to take this data set and apply it to the principle of we want to interpret things based on observation. So taking all of that, getting back into the data itself, yeah, Ruby beat the mess out of Kaguya over the course of the weekend. That's an interesting one. Ruby also had the highest winning percentage of any deck in the top 10. 
58.4%, like a fantastic winning percentage, honestly. But its top percentage, its conversion rate was below average. There's a lot more data that needs to be analyzed, like the round by round data, right? Like where was Ruby getting its wins, right? What round was it getting its wins in? It did decently in the Dow matchup. It won 17 of 37 games against Dow. It didn't really have any like disastrously bad matchups that sank it. You know what I mean? Like it didn't do well in the slime, but only 16 games there. So I don't know. Like I'm not entirely sure what kept Ruby out of top eight. It had eight X2s, which was one more than slime. But then looking at slime's numbers, slime only won 46% of its games. Now, part of this is going to be, you know, slime's popular. Um, slime also has multiple different builds. And then so it's also some of it's going to be the number of different builds. Yeah, that's going to be one of the big things with that list specifically. And I think that's what it, one of the things that we're going to be diving into as we continue to explore and kind of dive into the data more is looking at the different matchups and of what breakdowns of different decks kind of like how slime has multiple builds what do those multiple builds look like how did those fare going into the different decks different sets and you know same kind of thing for ruby right like there are a couple of different ways you can build ruby mm -hmm. so seeing how well those individual builds did i think is going to be some interesting and potentially useful data but that's going to be something we're going to explore over time as we continue to look at the data and kind of build out what went on throughout the tournament. Yeah. Let's move down past those top four real quick. Fate, 23 decks, only one top, four X2s. Its one top was Gilshot. Fate's at a weird spot. Like, you saw a lot of Fate running around. A lot of people on Bar Choice. Um, a lot of people on Bar Salvage. Um, definitely more people on the Saber top end than I expected. That seems to have, you know gained a lot of popularity in recent weeks still not there though right like none of them topped other than literal gill shot <laughs> i also think it's partly because it's a healing top end that has a higher explosive damage ceiling than the other potential healing top end being the neg soul. there's still some potential in fate right like it's not Fate as a set is not dead in the water. Eight bars dead in the water. The rest of Fate is still fine. It's not great. It's fine. It still has those pieces, right? It has those core engine pieces. The Shiro, the Ilya, the 2-1. Like, those are the pieces that keep it relevant. It doesn't have great level 1 combos, and it doesn't have great top ends. Just, it doesn't. But I'm starting to see why people are liking the Saber. It's more of just the guaranteed damage, right? You're going to get something with the Saber more often than not. You're probably going to get three damage in that lane. It's going to be really hard for your opponent to cancel all three of those swings, right? To cancel your initial swing and the two for three. So you're almost guaranteed three damage in that lane. If you can, you know, pay for an Icy Tail elsewhere, now all you have to do is stick one more swing and you've stuck seven, you can win games. With that in mind, looking at one of the other decks as well, that really had a kind of very similar numbers to fate was SAO, right? Mm -hmm. We had very similar representation numbers. SAO got a couple more tops with the top eight, as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, fate, but all three of the SAO builds that made it into the top eight were different because we had eight wind in, in EU. And then in NA, we had the pants book that we already talked about at somewhat length, as well as eight standby, which we talked about a little bit already. All three of those builds vastly different from one another. Yeah, and we talked about all of these decks, right, in our preview show. And we expected that the one that was going to be most likely to do well was 8 Wind. I don't think either of us thought 8 Standby or Last Shot had a real chance. We, we, we put 8 Standby in the Expect Not to Top, and we put Shocked If Top for... Last Shot. Yep. And Last Shot was one of two with the Adventure Time Yep, that shocked us by securing a top. And, I don't know, maybe maybe I've been underestimating Sword Art. Like, it did really well at Springfest in terms of representation, in terms of conversion rate. But I thought, the meta's really unkind to it now. 
Like, maybe, maybe Sword Art's time has actually passed, but nope. Sword Art, still relevant. Notably, none of them are playing the level one alicization combo with Kirito. Yeah. I think that that's one of the relevant pieces with that. Yeah, that's definitely something important. Um, you know, we kind of assumed that that was going to be like the core level one combo for Sword Art going forward, and it turns out not necessarily. I think, and this is where you have to you know interpret the numbers, right? Because it's it's not enough just to you know see the numbers and the numbers never lie and all that. You have to you know you have to put some interpretation into it. I think that. Three tops on three X2s is a little ambitious. I don't think that's a normal rate. Like, if you look down the rest of these, you don't see as high of a conversion between the X2s and the top eights, right? Mm hmm No, absolutely. And I just, and I, and I think that that's telling of that it's, while that happened... That may not always be the case, which is why I put it on the same level with Fate, because those numbers are very similar in what they were doing. Like, the difference was just between them were very similar. Well, its win percentage is below 50%. And, you know, one of the reasons that, and the, one of the reasons that we have so many different numbers on this screen, right, is because these numbers reflect different things. Winning percentage isn't always useful, because if you have one person who just goes 0 and 7, that can really tank a set's win percentage. Like, it just does, you know? That person nullifies someone who goes 7-0 and and gets a top. So, win percentage is something that has to be taken with a grain of salt. Conversion rate has to be taken with a grain of salt, because that favors decks that have fewer sets. The highest conversion rate on this table is level 5 Sunshine, and we'll get to that. Who was played by one person this weekend. <laughs> so, you know, top eight, X2, like, there's a reason that we have all these different numbers up here. These numbers, to me, tell me that Sword Art is definitely still relevant. More relevant than I gave it credit for, for sure. I thought it was going to drop off after its good Spring Fest performance. It did not. So I'm going to think twice before I count out Sword Art for the next major. Like, Sword Art has been relevant for a long time, and it, you know... When I thought it was dead, it was not. So I'm going to keep paying attention to Sword Art. In the same way that I'm going to keep paying attention to Ruby, you know, and Fate. Like, not top tier, but certainly good enough to compete. And in the hands of a talented player, and I think that that's a huge thing, right? Like, if a player is good and has, you know, experience with a list and has done a good job building a list then you've got something that's dangerous. Like, we've had, you know, DeVita on Card Captor. We've had Vince on Goblin Slayer. We've had June on Batman Ninja, right? We've had excellent players playing sets that are objectively kind of less good, but they win with them because they're good players. So I think that Sword Art, being decent, being relevant, in the hands of a good player, like it was in the hands of some good players this weekend, can still do well. But I think your average sword art list is still going to be less good. And the ones that crutch on the level 1 Kirito combo seem to be, in particular, not as relevant. None of them went X2. But I think the biggest disappointment of the whole tournament is probably quintuplets. 40% win percentage. Only one X2 in 17 decks. Yikes. We expected more from this set, and it really didn't deliver. Yeah, pretty much. Like, there was a number of different builds for this set um, because of how expansive the set is. So I can see why it would have such an inflated representation and low scoring because of how varied that set is in and amongst itself. No, that makes sense. I think Bang Dream's kind of in the same place. Like... Every other Bang Dream set is a waifu list, right? Like, it's all, you know, it's it's trait-based or band-based, you know. And I think 
quintuplets is a similar kind of set still though quintuplets in particular like we really thought bar choice we had a chance to do something and like it ranked you know in the top 10 in the community tier list you and i had it you know decently high we had it in the among the sets that we expected to get a top and it did not it, it did not it, it had one x2 out of 17 yeah that's not very good like you would you would have expected at least one of those bar choices to do better and it did not. And like when we break it down further, like at some point we're going to do that work and we're going to break it down further and see like what quintuplets deck got run the most. But I was definitely expecting Bar Choice to be a little more impressive than it was. And Bang Dream's kind of the same way. It's waiting on the next set. Bang Dream's waiting on the next set. It's going to be relevant again. Right now it's still pretty not relevant unless, you know, you're playing one specific list. It's still pretty rough. It has it has a lot of rough matchups right now. It really does. It really does. Adventure Time got a top. It was the other deck along with Last Shot from Sword Art that we had on our Shocked If It Tops tier. Lost a lot of its representation from Springfest. It was a lot more represented at BSF than it was here. Low win percentage, but there are a handful of good Adventure Time players. I think that's the thing to take away from this with Adventure Time. The average Adventure Time deck is not going to be that good, but there are a handful of people who are really good with Adventure Time who can be dangerous, and they're the ones who are going to go X2, get top 8. I think that's the future with Adventure Time, because it still has that high potential with that top end that can do so much damage, but the deck needs a good pilot. And then you have Konosuba, which is still here. It's trying. <laughs> 12 Konosuba players, like, I get it, I get it. I tried to make Konosuba good forever, I get it. Uh, 41% win percentage, it went X and 2 once. It's present, it's something you'll probably have to play into for a time, just because Konosuba remains a popular series, and the cards are cheap and kind of everywhere, but Konosuba's probably going to continue to fade from relevance until and unless we get a Season 3 set sometime in 2023. Of course, Belfry, we talked about it. It showed up eight times, but the one came through, right? We probably wouldn't be talking about Bovary if it weren't for Tim and his fantastic showing. He, he carried the set. He carried the set. It only had a 46% win percentage. Like, he was incredible. So, you know, props to him. I don't think this really proves the point of Bovary is still, like, meta-relevant. I think Tim's a really good player, and I think he made a great meta call with a specific Bofuri build. I think that's more what's happening here. As much as you and I have been on the Bofuri train, <laughs> watching Bofuri do well is super exciting because it's like, oh yeah, you know, we were right, but we kind of weren't on this one. The Bofuri list that we thought was going to be good, I don't even know if it was even played at all. This you could you could cross out the BFR and just put Tim because that was what made this work. And then, of course, Love Live Sunshine. We talked about it in the preview show. Love Live Sunshine is still good, darn it. I don't like playing into it. It won 70% of its games. It topped. It was fantastic. Despite the fact that it only showed up twice, I never want to play into Love Live Sunshine because it can burn you to death. I would like to point out, I want to give props to Kronos for being able to be the one Sunshine player twice to do extremely well with that deck and demonstrate why it's still viable in 2022 clearly it's capable when again piloted by a good player if there's any major takeaway from this i think the big one is there's a reason that we see the same names at the top of these lists right there's a reason that we see the same players tournament after tournament having success with decks it's because they're really good players you know some of the best players in the world came out to this event and you know, the people that win, there's a reason that it feels like it's a lot of the same people a lot of the time. It's because they're very good. This is a game that can feel very tilting. But the very best players find ways out of those situations. The very, very best players build their decks so they can escape bad deck states and get results in spite of those things. And that's where you get players like Tim, players like Vince, players like Kronos, the ones who come through and dominate these tournaments because they make the right meta calls. They know what their decks do in and out. They're able to get out of bad situations and win games that they otherwise wouldn't be able to win. And I think that this weekend proved once again 
that so much of success in this game is predicated on player skill. A good number of it, I think, is, involves uh, deck building and building your decks for the matchups you're going to know you're going to face and playing to the outs that you put into those decks to get to that point too. So I think a lot of that player skill comes in and during the deck building phase as well as then in that moment in the playing. So that's it for now. Thank you for joining us. Once again, link in the description to the full data set that we collected and put together. Regarding this weekend's tournaments, it's all there. We will be back probably talking about more data at some point. Might be the next Clock Talk, might not be. We're going to sort that out in time. But rest assured, there will definitely be more data to talk about with Rumble. Uh, just real quick, the stuff that we're going to have on the data sheets available, uh, we're going to be a link in the description below for that. We're going to have not only the representation data as well as the matchup data uh, from all of those sets from the different tournaments and then organize that all that together as well. With that in mind, we're also going to have the deck codes for all of the lists that we have available with that and alongside those, the climax splits that those run. So that way we have all that information available. So we'll be back on Thursday, Ruby, Uncommons, Commons, and Trial Deck Cards for 5 Cards 5 Minutes. Next Tuesday, Brandon will have a deck tech for Bang Dream, the new set that's coming out. And we'll have gameplay for that the following Thursday. And in two weeks, we'll be back with another Clock Talk. Until next time, thank you for joining us. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And have a good one. We'll see you then.